Kilimanjaro is beautiful. It's the kind of mountain a child would draw, rising perfectly, hugely, triangularly, breast-shaped actually, out of the plains of Africa, just south of the equator. It is really high, just under 20,000 feet and 6,000 meters. It's the highest point in Africa. And I have come to Africa to climb this mountain with a group of mainly women, several breast cancer survivors. And the question is, why would these ordinary women who have already been through some trauma set such an extraordinary bar for themselves? Why Kilimanjaro? Will they get to the top? And what difference will it make in their lives? We're gonna make it to the top, the real top. Getting to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro is no walk in the park. The mountain demands a lot. Right. The body hurts so much. I'm having problems breathing. You want to give it a try at least for 20, 25 more minutes? Okay. We will climb 13,000 feet through four distinct ecosystems, essentially going from equatorial jungle to Arctic ice and back over the next nine days. We hope this gives our bodies enough time to acclimatize, as altitude sickness is a very serious issue, and people die on this mountain every year. That was the toughest part in the dark, the sun south. Worth everything, everything. What is this journey about? What are the breast cancer survivors trying to prove? This disease affects so many women and their families and friends. One in nine Canadian women will be diagnosed. One in 28 will die. Can climbing a mountain help you get over it or put it in perspective? Can anything? I started to have to make decisions about treatment and I thought, oh my God, now they're asking, for this or this or that or that and I thought I, I couldn't make a decision without you know doing some research and I was so frozen with terror that I couldn't even read so I went to see a psychologist I got and um, he says so what is it so you're so terrified about I mean what is your problem and I said well death and dying and he says well why are you so scared of death and I thought is this guy nuts like isn't everybody? I mean, that's the final thing. You're gone, you're wiped off the earth. And uh, he says, well, what is it about dying that is terrifying you? Really, it came down to regrets, having regrets. I'd lived my life for my family, my husband, and everybody else, and there were a few things I wanted to do in the world. One of them was to land and take off in an airplane just once. I was a teacher and after the breast cancer diagnosis, I followed my passion and became a pilot. And now I'm flying for the Ministry of the Environment, their investigations and enforcement branch. I'm a spy in the sky. I had my mammogram and I came back and you know they said, uh, yes, you have cancer. And so I decided I needed to take care of business, you know, just, you know, in case. So, you know, I went out and had my will done and, you know, all looked after all that and decided to go plan my funeral just in case. I picked up all the packages, picked out my urn, did all that stuff. You and then, didn't. And, really? and then we had to go and we had to write the goodbye speech. And as soon as I started, I broke down crying. Like, that was when I, like, that's when it really hit me is like, I don't want to die. I am not willing to die. I guess the hardest thing was, you know, I thought, I'm going to leave my children. There's nobody, you know, there's nobody, for, you know, to, to look after them and nobody's going to come to the funeral. No, you know, I don't have any friends. And I was thinking all this stuff and it was really, uh, it was really, you know, sad and difficult. And then when I got sick, everybody came to help. No family history. Had, uh, she had two children, um, had them very young, uh, breast had both children, um, was healthy, fit, uh, probably as fit as I'd been in 15 years, thank goodness, uh, when I was diagnosed. And uh, 
I'm a mom, <laughs> and with me today up here, my daughter Jennifer, mm -hmm. my granddaughter Brittany. In 2003, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, it was shortly after the passing of my father, and then there was my mother. She had lost her soulmate, and what do I do? Like, uh, uh, do I leave her alone to be sad? Suddenly, I had cancer, and I was home for a year. I spent time with my mother, and she forgot about the loss of my father. She took such great care of me, having gone through what she had. She's very strong and I got my strength from my mom. So I have great respect. It's hard for her that I'm here because I'm her only child. For me, every step I take is a step away from cancer. And me getting better gives me strength and hope. Get us in our last clean shot. <laughs> Is everybody ready? We are heading to the north side of Kilimanjaro, near the Kenyan border with Tanzania, to trek the less traveled Rongai route. Tanzania is one of the poorest countries in the world. So many Tanzanian men are waiting at the trailhead to be picked as porters for a pay of $10 a day. We hire 150 of them for our very large group. I joined Wellspring and one of the things they, they taught us there is to express ourselves through paintings. And you did this in 2004? Yes. I didn't link it to Kilimanjaro, but it was my journey of crossing, and it was hard. And why, well, why did you picture mountains? Why were you crossing mountains um, when you were when I think you it's the color. Its color was meaningful to me in a way that it keeps me alive. Were you? I was terrible. You're emotional now. What are you I'm thinking? Yeah. I'm thinking I'm coming to the mountain. I'm giving myself <laughs> over for this journey. I want to make it. Yeah. And it's really important. You'll make it. So we start. Wow. I know that they did a climb a few years ago and it was to raise awareness for breast cancer and raise funds and I thought I would have liked to have gone on it but it, I found it scary the whole idea and uh, I you know the, that high my the planes I fly don't go this high we're supposed to carry legally oxygen after 10,000 feet and now you're going to walk up to almost 20,000 feet I mean really <laughs> It's probably one of the best things that's happened to me in my life. As much as how difficult it was, because it set me free from all those negative feelings about myself that I had. Even though I'm no longer, you know, completely, you know, there's pieces missing. But, um, but now, you know, I'm, I'm happy with who I am. So not anxious, not... Not yet. Not till we have to go up there. I think it's um, changed what's important and not important. I've always been a, and can tell you even when the kids were little, I've always been a don't sweat the small stuff kind of person. I think I'm probably even more that way now and even more trying to be conscious of preserving the time you've got and spending in the right ways as opposed to worrying too much about things that aren't important. You bring the, the ghosts and the spirits of people that some people I know are carrying ashes of people who are dear to them to deposit at the top. People bring an enormous amount of baggage to the mountain. Uh, 
or to give to the mountain or to give to the gods or to commune because you're so high up. Um, I don't know what else I want from it, but boy, it just feels like a pretty spectacular thing to do to go to the roof of Africa. terrible night. Oh, I had the the runs, vomiting, and cramps. I could not, you know, 20 minutes at a time was, was all I could stay in, in bed. However, my readings were good. <laughs> so your oxygen uptake is fine. fine so there's rate was some good. kind of bug because it's so dirty. I mean, it's so unspeakably dusty and dirty. You just yeah. can't keep your hands clean, so something I has just disagreed yeah, with you. I think it's bacterial. Valerie, I yeah. can ask you the same question. <laughs> Why well, are you here? Well, I sort of gathered, you know, various groups to and my sisters and my family to yes. enrich the experience and to learn about Africa and uh, like to experience, you yeah. know, the people who are here, quite frankly, mm -hmm. what the mountain has to offer because it's also a spiritual place and yes. being on the mountain is a privilege. Yes. So that's why I'm here. You have so much emotion. I, I sometimes do. think how, you know, when you're home in Toronto and the accounting job or whatever, what what happens to this big heart? I don't really share it with a lot of people. I share it with a few people. Um, I'm not one to just open up to everybody. Uh, I enjoy my work, but work is not my life. There's a lot of living outside of work mm -hmm. because when I die, I'm not going to say, oh, I wish I worked more. It's certainly not. This, this is what enriches my soul and makes me who I am. Well, you got to be thinking about your dad, eh? Yes, I have. I have his hanky. <laughs> Aww. I was taking it with me. I was thinking of him and I said how proud he would be of me. Dr. Shauna Burke is an Ottawa-based professor and the second Canadian woman to reach the summit of Mount Everest. She's here on Mount Kilimanjaro to conduct cutting-edge research on this group of breast cancer survivors in order to unlock the key to survivorship and how to thrive post-treatment. The research that I'm doing here with breast cancer survivors is I'm looking um, at the survivorship experience through the lens of a climb on Mount Kilimanjaro. The majority of research that has been done with breast cancer survivors has looked at the treatment. So the period of time when breast cancer survivors are undergoing treatment. Very little research has looked at life after medical treatment for cancer mm -hmm. and sort of how women cope with the memories of their treatment and the possibility of a cancer recurrence. And what, what we're finding now with the advances with the medication and the treatments that are taking place, more and more women are living and so it's really important to explore the survivorship experience. What these women are going through after having gone through treatment, the quality of life that they're living, and how they're coping, again, with the memories of their treatment. Some people say, well, you know, if I've survived chemo and radiation, which is the toughest thing they'd ever been through, then then I can sure do this. Are you, are you thinking that? Or are you just powering on, not thinking? Chemo was the hardest thing I've ever done. Just so hard on your body and... Yeah, yeah. And... And what, your self-image or just like, I don't want to be this... No, it just really, I had very aggressive chemo and it really took a lot out of me. And I think I can do anything after that. Yeah. <laughs> It 
it's been tough because my younger sister Lorna is really sick. She caught some really bad parasite, a giardia, which is like your nightmare of what you don't want to happen. And she's so disappointed, she's so weak. Because she's been dreaming about this for so long that we do this all together. I got giardia. The worst luck possible on a trip you that plan for a year and a half. And that could be just, worse. Oh, well, I don't know actually how it could, what be, could worse. be worse. Well, if you'd broken your ankle, you would have had to just go down. Yeah, this way, you just sort of have to struggle through feeling no way like back. death. But you the pills are going for uh, The pills are coming. Yeah, they're rushing. They're sending a courier. Which is what's so amazing. A runner up Which the hill way? Up from to meet us. Up the other route? Yeah, so yeah. I'll have my pills tomorrow. Oh, that would be Isn't wonderful. Isn't that awesome? Well, well uh, hope it works. Well, thank yeah. you. Well, you're tough as tough as nails. Thanks. <laughs> We're the oh. sisters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, isn't this cool, actually? I know uh, the chemotherapy, it could just, it just wrecks the mind and the soul. Uh, it makes me become a different person. And uh, here I am today climbing this mountain. And it means a lot to me. It truly means a lot to me. Breast cancer survivors adopt this attitude of hopelessness or helplessness, uh, one that is very pessimistic. They sort of see themselves as a victim. And then other studies have found that some women actually adopt an attitude of, that of a fighting spirit. These are women who are going out there and pushing themselves, pushing themselves past their limits, uh, wanting to find out, you know, what 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 they're made of and talking to some of them and just asking them, well, why are you here? They said, well, I'm here to push myself. Time. Oh, good. I don't know whether I've got anything left. Congratulations. <laughs> I've gotten this far. How did you do today? Better. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot better. Yeah. I like having the visual point. Yeah, it is. It makes and a I, difference. Oh, yeah. And I don't think I'm feeling as sick today as yesterday. Yesterday was not a good day. As far as friends go, um, I lost one of my best friends because uh, she was so supportive throughout the whole thing. And uh, afterwards, she, she, um, she thinks I'm not over it. Like she'll, you know, like get over it. And I think partly what it, and why I'm not over it is because I'm involved with Willow, which is a breast cancer support organization. I'm with Dragons of Breast. Here I joined a breast cancer group going up the mountain. And she sees it as I haven't let go of, you know, traumatic situation. And I don't see it as that. I just, they're a wonderful group of women who are living life and, uh, you know, going for it. Now this is like one of the really great joys walking with my son. How great is that to be able to come and sort of share an adventure and a challenge in this incredible part of the world. I can't tell you how much it means to have him here. Well, it seemed when you sent yourself back to school that was a really tough thing. Yeah, I, I, had, a, I had another career, but uh, it didn't pay enough money for like to support three kids on my own. So I picked a, a career that, you know, I'd be able to, uh, you know, manage the, you know, raising the girls. And it was really tough when I was going to school, you know, we, you know, years lining up at the food bank and buying clothes from Salvation Army and, you know, when they were little and that was pretty tough. You know, I, I kind of did it all, you know, participated in the community garden so you could grow your own food. And I mean, working part-time. I mean, I did all that while I was going to school and trying to raise kids. So, you know, starting a new... <laughs> Yasmin, <laughs> Yasmin just reached a milestone there. <laughs> yes, it is. Hang on, I don't want to... <laughs> Sorry, continue on. <laughs> Man, so that was, those were, those were hard times. Yeah, and just when my life, when everything in my life that I thought was going good, 
that's when I found out I had cancer. Hello. Hey, William. Yeah, yeah, it's just raining. You see the snow starts falling down and just have a little bit problem of the tent. So we have to swap the tent, you know. Uh, make sure people they just, I mean, get to their tent without getting wet. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy better. Thank you. <laughs> well, we have our oxygen uptake taken every morning, so I think I was at 91 or whatever. But you know, I was sucking air even in the tent last night. I remember that sort of gasping for oxygen. <sighs> Starting to feel the altitude for sure. Guys, 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 you got medicine. Lorna! Oh, Lorna? This is my, my sister's medicine's here. Hey, hey Lorna? Yeah. Your medicine's here. <gasps> Lorna, maybe this is <laughs> You guys. The medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So nice of you. I'm oh, getting it's making me look cry. Cry. It's I'm making me I'm cry. already <laughs> crying. This is so nice of them. Oh, oh boy. Man. She can see. Kibo. She thinks she can see Kibo up there. You can. You can see Kibo. It's right there. There's quite a bit of more snow on the other side. Hey, eh? when we first got there, I thought there wasn't any snow. Oh, I'm just taking it easy. When I get there, I get there. <laughs> right now, it feels really good. Got an oxygen uptake like Lance Armstrong. He's one of the greatest mountaineers in the world and has the greatest name in the world, which is Hector Postillon. <laughs> so he's like a mountain goat. He can just clamber up and you know take a shot while we're. I, I actually was really huffing and puffing up that little bit. But man, when you look back at where we've come from and see the clouds moving in or whatever, I mean, you just can't believe how lucky we are to be here. What happens when people go to altitude is. Uh, as, as a species, we evolved at sea level. So uh, we were not meant to be at these altitudes. People will feel weaker, even if, if they're not, if they haven't had a hard day climbing or hiking, they, they overall feel more weak. And it's all related to, to the lack of oxygen. Yeah, we're heading up to 19 and a half thousand or... Yeah, the summit of Kilimanjaro yeah. is 19,500 thousand so almost a double to go. Absolutely, and, and the higher we go, the, the less oxygen there will be, and the more some of, of these uh, symptoms or this physical discomfort will accentuate. And, and it's something that anyone that goes to altitude would just have to deal with. The first person to summit Mount Kilimanjaro, after a couple of people had tried, was a German named Hans Meyer. It took him three times, he finally succeeded in 1889, and wrote that the night he spent at the summit, he wouldn't have traded places with anyone in the world. Since then, of course, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have climbed that mountain. It's just become one of those destinations. The fastest anyone has gone up is five hours, 37 minutes and 38 seconds. The fastest anyone has gone up and down, I think it's a Tanzanian who set the record in eight hours and 40 minutes 
or so, two cousins from uh, England, the Crane brothers, actually cycled up to Mount Kilimanjaro, powered by Mars bars or something. And the guy who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was raising money for charity and climbed to the summit wearing a giant 10-foot rhinoceros costume, which would be incredibly hard. And during the Millennium celebrations, because it's just one of those places on the planet that draws people, 7,000 people were on that mountain. And it really doesn't look that big anymore <laughs> now that we've climbed as much as we have. So I've got my hopes up that I'm going to make it. After you put, take, give yourself a Nupogen needle. The body hurts so much. The legs are weak. Very pain. And that's what I felt it feels like now. I feel like an 80 year old woman walking here. At this altitude. Yeah. yeah. Slow, slow. Slow but steady, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's how you get up there. That's how I get up. daughter um, she didn't speak of it at all didn't want to discuss it and I felt like she was bottling it up and I wanted to talk to her nope and when she was 19 grade 13 she was one of the last to go through that she um, chose breast cancer as a subject for across the curriculum one painting it was of an apple core and I thought what has that got to do she says you know you had to go back it's like the surgeons cut away everything and all that was left was the core of you and you discovered who you really were. And I, it was just so moving and I thought, you know, she got what I went through. my goal but I'll try the summit too <laughs> but this was it and it was worth every minute I'm not gonna have any regrets not having tried this <laughs> if I don't make it to the summit it's just one day anyway it was wonderful It's so much closer now. Oh, that's now. impossible task. I'm here. <laughs> it was trouble getting up this hill. <laughs> Last few steps are always hard. It looked really hard from down there, but from up here, it's a piece of cake. <laughs> we're gonna make it to the top, the real top. I can't believe we're here. Can't believe it. You excited? <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is really exciting because we're now at the base of the mountain we're going to climb and you can actually see the route up the mountain which you know we'll be doing in the middle of the night and then as you can see it sort of zigs and zags on the screen and then goes straight up to Gilman's Point whew, which is considered the top then you can go through the crater to Uhuru which is the real summit another couple of hours beyond that you can see a fair bit of snow but you know needless to say you're probably aware that you know, there's a great deal of concern about what's happening to those glaciers uh, since 1912 when they first started surveying them i think it's been about an 88 percent decline they're saying since 89 uh, 33 percent decline and they're worried they'll be ice free completely uh, by 2015 which would be a disaster for the Chaga people below who rely on those glaciers and the water they provide for drinking and for irrigation and hydroelectric power and as they say you know not to mention tourism because people come to see the magnificent snows of Kilimanjaro 
We leave tonight and I'm trying to figure out what that piece of rock and ice at the summit of Kilimanjaro represents to me. What is the meaning of the mountain? Mountains used to be thought of as scary, dangerous places to avoid. Now they're seen as places of wonder, to be closer to nature and God, places to lose yourself and find yourself, to rise up and gain perspective, always mindful that they're both beautiful and deadly. I felt like I had a good night's sleep. It's only been a few hours. Uh, I think I'm warm enough. I'll see what happened up there. Apparently there's a mountain up there somewhere. Where? I don't think I slept in well. Wink. Everybody's really just anxious. Their lights, no one can recognize anybody. It's the first time I put on a hat. It looks like Halloween and everybody looks like a Michelin man. I've got more clothes on. Okay, you want to know what I've got on? I got three layers of long underwear, a polar tech, and two down jackets. It's so cold. Actually, this is really nice to do it in the dark. It's a yeah, mighty big mountain out there. Time. The one that I know is out there. <sighs> but I'm ready. Are you leading us? Yes. Very slowly. Very slowly. You know how to mount it. You should go slow there. Yeah, don't hurry yeah, the mountain. Yeah, yeah. How long, f you figured at Gilman's, maybe five hours? Five hours to six hours. Yeah. yeah. We'll obey you. Yeah, yeah, I'll make sure you'll conquer there. <laughs> I'm after you. You're yeah. the greatest guy. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Remember everything. Thanks for everything, Alan. See you at the top. Breathing deeply. Exhale. Give people space. You must give people space. Jump in. There was a great line by Garrison Keeler that said, you know, about heading off into the unknown. It's like taking a car trip at night. Uh, you can only see as far as the headlights in front of you, but you can make a whole journey that way. And you sort of feel that way. You can only see just feet in front of you. We're on Mount Kilimanjaro. We're climbing to the summit. Uh, but you can only see the darkness and the stars, but the sun will rise and uh, we'll be at the top. What are we doing, Aki? A little out of breath. I'm trying to conserve my breath. I want to make it to the top. Anyway, I'd like also like a little soup. We're only halfway. Are we halfway yet? Yep. I think we're halfway, yep. Yeah. Yes. A little tired. Soup. A little cold. Yeah. Toes and feet. Just one foot in front of the other. We're trying to warm up Cheryl's feet. They got really cold. So we're messaging them, trying to get blood to circulate in her toes because I think that's why she's getting them cold. What's the matter? Tired? No, she has a really awful back. She had an operation. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's, okay. It's, it's, yeah, I heard about the neck yeah. thing. Okay. It's amazing she made it up this far. I'm just having problems breathing, like getting enough oxygen in my lungs, so I, I'm just deciding to go back down. Okay. Like I'm not tired, I don't feel sick, but um, I'm having problems breathing. They're going a little bit too fast for me and I can't keep up, so I'm just gonna no, go back. Go slowly now. What's that? Yeah, go slowly. No, I'm just gonna go back now.
We started our summit push at 1 a.m., a very silent, slow-moving train of headlamps. 35 climbers, 5 Western, and 14 African guides. We're trying to get to the top of the crater called Gilman's Point, and if we have enough to keep going for a few hours, to Uhuru, the summit. So far, the guides have sent down six people who are suffering from altitude sickness, and one with frozen feet. Debbie Hills has decided she can't keep up the pace any longer and will give up. I'm having problems breathing, so I'm just deciding to go back down. This is a pretty good altitude, 5,250 meters. How much farther is it? Uh, 450 meters still. 450? Yeah. Uh -huh. going faster. No, 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 no. I will come with me. We'll go slowly as much as we can, OK? OK. And I'm sure you do it, because we're not tired. We don't have another problem. No, I up. don't have a headache. I don't have anything. I just, I'm running out of breath. They're going too fast. So me. what do you say if he stays with you and you try to find a really slow pace. Yeah. You want to okay. give it a try at least for 20, 25 more minutes? Okay. Okay? Yeah. yeah. You move this, you move it, guys. Your machines! Ten more steps. We haven't got strength. Oh. Oh, I'm here. You need this bit. I know I got asked, how do you feel? I couldn't even think about how I felt. I couldn't even think. Physically, I've never done anything so hard, but I know that once this, I, I had the uh, double mastectomy and reconstruction, and after uh, that, um, it was very difficult to, to move. I mean, you're sore everywhere. It's like a truck has just driven over you, and then they tell you, now you, you should try and get up out of bed and go to the washroom on your own. Well, that was, that was just as hard as that. <laughs> what does this mean for you? Um, <laughs> that there's a lot of things that I didn't think that I could do that I can do. It's kind of surreal that I've actually made it all the way to the top. Um, I know I did actually think about turning back. I think I was quite emotional when I got to the top because I was still carrying a lot of self-doubt and I really had thought that I had gotten rid of that. But um, each time I face a new challenge, I realize there's still a little bit more to work on. And uh, this was definitely a big achievement for me. And I think if I can do this, I can probably do anything. Isn't that something, Jasmine? It is a pleasure for me. Awesome. Thank you. A cancer journey is not easy, and climbing up here wasn't easy either. I mean, on the way here, I thought oh, it was so hard. And I could turn back, and I said, no, I'm not turning back. I have to get up here. That would be like giving up on myself. So I need it up here. It's been a long time coming. 
And, and you know, I couldn't get up that mountain without the other women as well here. It's a team work, just like cancer. You can't survive cancer alone by yourself. You have to have people there for you, to help you on the way, push you along, pick you up when you're, when you're down and you're so broken, you know? One thing I've learned is that I have to accept help when it's given to me. You know, you have to be able to receive as well. And that is a big thing I'm learning to deal with, you know. There's so much people will give to you if you let yourself receive it. Thank you. Together. <laughs> <laughs> You're just thinking of mom and dad, I got sad. Ah. That's a great they, achievement. They, they, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they think we were nuts, but they <laughs> think we I thought I was nuts climbing one or halfway up here. What the? I could be a beach. <laughs> well, we made it. Oh, very moving. It was an overwhelming oh. experience. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Wendy. Congratulations, you did it. You made it to Gilman. Congratulations! One step at a time. You did it. Well, I can't believe that the three of us did it. And we did it together. We got up there together. And for me, that was very special. Three months after my treatments ended, we did this. And we committed. During my chemo, we were going to do it. And we actually did it. And getting up on that mountain, it was like, <laughs> it was like I was cleansed when I looked out and saw the vista and saw the mountain and saw the ice and the snow. It was like, I'm healed. I'm better. I'm going to go on and live the rest of my life the way I had planned on living it. Cancer's not going not gonna to get me. I'm going to beat this thing being there with my daughter and granddaughter there was nothing there aren't words to describe how I felt up there on the mountain I can't, I can't describe it in words it's really an honor for me to be climbing with these people they have made an exceptional effort. We are now at the top of Africa. Oh, that's so oh, great! Wow. It's a miracle to be here. <laughs> wow! Hey, Jeffrey! Hi, baby! Hi, baby. Oh. <laughs> Way to go! This is worth everything. Everything. Look at that. We are at the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, the roof of Africa. Emerson wrote, Mount to Paradise by the Stairway of Surprise. And life has all kinds of surprises for us, good and bad, including getting breast cancer. But we never know what's gonna make us stronger or who's gonna be our teachers or what experiences are gonna change our lives. But on this particular day, I think I'll change the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson and say, Mount to Paradise, by the stairway of surprise and wonder. Wageniwe to see of Jesus. 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 W